So that guy will be our mascot for the series. I like him. I don't know who he is, but I like him. And I'm really glad that you're here with us as we do start this new series. Before we do that, though, let me just say hello not only to the people at the Legacy Campus, but to all those at 544 at our campus there. So glad you're with us. To uh, those who are online right now watching in your pajamas or wherever you are. Uh, like my family in Alabama, I said I would give a shout out today. So here it is, Roll Tide. And to those of you who are at Sloan Creek, also, this weekend is the last weekend that Sloan Creek will be in their school um, that, that, that we've been renting. Next week, they get into their new digs. So that's pretty cool, pretty exciting. And uh, it's awesome, actually. So we are starting this new series on this Old Testament character who was quite a character named Jacob. The series called Hashtag Blessed, which we'll explain, you know, well, ha- Officially, it's hashtag blessed emoji prayer hands is the theme of the series. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I want us to start the series in a unique way because I think it's a unique series. And the reason I say it's a unique series is because of how God's already used it in my life and the preparation of it. And it's a series, honestly, I didn't even want to do. When I was on study break, kind of conceiving the series that we're doing now, I was preparing a a series on Abraham, and I thought that would be awesome. And and so to do that, I was reading through Genesis a bunch, because you have Abraham, and then his son Isaac, and then Jacob, and Joseph. But I kept getting stuck by God and Jacob. And where God was speaking to me was in the Jacob narrative. And and that was surprising to me, because I've never liked Jacob a whole lot. I've never identified with Jacob a whole lot. He's like the worst hero in the Bible. He's a goober with a capital G in a lot of ways, and he made life so hard when God, it could have been so much easier. God wanted to give him so much, and he would never take, he just grasp and grasp and connive and control, and, and, and really what happened in that process is I saw that, it was like God saying to me over and over again, hey, there's a lot of Jacob in you, and, uh, and I think there's a lot of Jacob in all of us, and so I think God's going to really do something. So here's what I want us to do. Jesus had a phrase. He said, for those who have ears to hear. Not everybody has ears to hear. Not everybody is open to what God says and open to change their life. And and so I want us to to open up our lives. If you're up for that, just start this series to say, just ask God to help us do that. So let's bow our heads together, and I'll pray on our behalf. Father, I do pray you give us ears to hear what you want to say in this series as we come each week. And I pray you'd help us come with our hearts and minds open and pliable and ready. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Comfort us where we need to be comforted. And just speak to us. Help us listen and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. So this series is about Jacob, but even bigger than Jacob, it's really about this concept called the blessing And you'll hear a lot about the blessing because it's such a big deal in the story. Now, they had a unique spin on the blessing, as we'll see, but the blessing actually relates to all of us because you and I have all been committed to live in this life of blessing. We've been... We've been created for it, and therefore we crave it like a cell phone, you know, that has a chip that's constantly searching for connection. We're constantly searching for this life that God wants for us and typically lock into all the wrong things and, you know, end up missing it. We'll talk about that. But the blessing, now what is it? We've been created for it. What is it? Now, we use that phrase real loosely, right? We, we, we say when somebody, when you're praying for a meal, we say, hey, would you say the blessing, right? Or would you bless this food? And, and what does that mean? Like, how do you bless cauliflower? I mean, it needs it, but how would you, like, what, how does it, doesn't seem to work. So what is it, what does that mean, you know? Or, uh, or when somebody sneezes, they say, hachu, what do you say? Excuse you, stop it, it's gross. Yeah, that's what you say. No. You say, yeah, bless you. Um, People say, God bless you. You know, that happened to me. Some, somebody uh, that I met this morning, God bless you, which is nice, you know, but what does that mean? Um, when, you know, hashtag blessed. You know, that we're in, in, that we, we chose that. We'll have some fun with it. There's nothing wrong with using hashtag blessed. Um, but we're, we'll have a little bit of fun with it because uh, it, I think it's just easy to be really shallow with it. It's not bad. But when you look at the hashtag blessed, when you look at Instagram or you look at 
Twitter. Um, most of them are either ironic, people being, you know, sarcastic or ironic with it, or just generally want to say blessed because of something good that happens. So when good stuff happens, I'm blessed. When they don't happen, I'm not blessed is kind of the idea. And is that it? And what we're going to see is that it's actually much deeper than that, this concept of blessing. When God created humanity, the first thing He did after creating us is He blessed us. Now, what does that mean? And what would it be like if He hadn't? When He starts over with Noah after the flood, Noah and his family, and He's doing a do-over, the first thing He does when they get off the boat is He blesses them. When Jesus comes and gives his first big talk called the Sermon on the Mount, where he's announcing that his kingdom, his new way of life has come, that the king is here and the kingdom is here, and he's inviting people in, his invitation is, blessed are, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. All these categories of people that were never considered actually blessed in that culture 2,000 years ago or now, but he opens up the invitation list to say, I have come to bring a whole new way of life in my kingdom, a blessed life, a fulfilled life, a, a totally different way of life, this better way. And he tells us what it's like, and then he points to it. This is what you would need to do in order to live that, this blessed life. And this series is another way to look at that, to say, what does it mean to live in that better way, in the blessing that we've been created for, because few people actually do. And it's so easy to misunderstand, so easy to trade away, so easy to miss. This is a, a warning uh, story in some ways, as we'll see, but we're going to learn a lot about how to live into the blessing. Now, for this family, Jacob's family, whose granddad was Abraham, you may have heard of Abraham, this was a uniquely blessed family. They, they had an extra, major extra blessing attached to their family line because God made a covenant with Abraham. And that covenant came with a big blessing. The covenant was that from the line of Abraham would come a nation, and that nation would be God's people that would be the people through whom he would bless the world, through whom the Redeemer, Jesus, would come. He promised that he would multiply them, he would prosper them, he would protect them. There was a lot that came with that line of blessing all the way down to the Messiah. And it was passed down from generation to generation, kind of like a baton pass from runner to runner. And in their culture, it was assumed that the line of blessing would always pass to the oldest son. That wasn't biblical. That was cultural. That was their culture. Interestingly, as we'll see next week, God doesn't really even honor that. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't, never hardly, he doesn't even go to the oldest son. But in their culture, that's the way what they assumed would happen. They would always do that. It was called the birthright was the first part of that. The birthright, it, we'll learn about in the story today, is what the oldest son got. It was their right by birth, by being born first. They would get twice the inheritance. They would be the one to carry on the family name. It would be like the leader, the patriarch of the family. They would get the, uh, they would be the big, like big dog in the family whoever was born first. And it was assumed that whoever was, had the birthright would be the primary carrier of that blessing. And in this family, that's a really big deal because of that covenant to Abraham. So Abraham passes it to Isaac. Isaac is Jacob's dad. And the big question is, is Jacob going to get it or not? Because he's a twin. And his twin was named Esau. So it's a big deal while he's in Esau, I mean, excuse me, while Esau and Jacob are in Rebekah's belly, Who's going to be born first? Who's going to get the baton? Anybody like NASCAR? Because there's a race in this story about who's going to be first. And I'll spoil it for you. Esau's first, not Jacob. And that's going to cause a lot of tension. Because Esau has it, as we'll see today, and doesn't understand what he has. And he trades it away. Jacob doesn't have it, but really wants it and connives and manipulates for it, even though God has already said, I'm going to give it to you. And it already told Rebecca that. So we're going to see Jacob part of the story next week. But this week, we're going to focus on the Esau part of the story, who actually won, won the, the birthright and was the assumed carrier of the blessing, but he doesn't realize what he had. And by the end of, somewhere in this story, you and I are going to look at the Esau story and say, man, what a goober, what a doofus, what a dummy. But what I want us to be open to is how we do the same thing. We don't realize what God's given us, and we settle for so much less, and we do it all the time. And so let's be open as we look 
uh, at Genesis chapter 25. And we're going to be, this whole series is going to be so easy on you. If you want to turn in the Bible, you'll feel like a Bible genius because instead of having to look at the table of contents, it's the first book in the Bible. And every time, you know, you just go ahead and bring your Bible to this series because you'll look so smart. Because when I say turn to the passage, you can just say, oh, yeah, no problem. It's just right there. I know, I know the Bible. All right. So Genesis 25, verse 24. When the time came for her to give birth, Rebecca... There were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau, which means hairy. Uh, anybody named Harry? Here, I met a Harry at 9 o'clock at Legacy. Um, after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob, which in Hebrew sounds like a word that means heel grabber. Now, we'll talk about that next week. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, there's a lot of tension in that passage. For one thing, these two boys are very different from each other. They're about as different. I mean, they're twins, but they are not identical. They're the opposite of that. I mean, I have two boys. They're in many ways different, but they're in many ways alike. They have a lot in common. These two boys had nothing in common. Esau was a man's man from the beginning, testosterone, I mean, all over the place. I mean, he was hairy like from the start. In fact, he was so hairy, they named him Harry. That's pretty hairy. And he was so hairy, it says his skin was like a hairy garment, literally like a goat skin. I mean, if you, had, if you went to go, to, you know, to the hospital to, you know, look at Rebecca and, and meet the babies, and there's little cute Jacob, and then you see, you look at Esau, I'm like, oh, wow. It's like Chewbacca baby or Bigfoot baby. It's like, wow. You know, and you're like, oh, it's cute. You know, it's, yeah, that, you're hashtag blessed. You know, and, uh, and then you walk away, and you're like, um, what was that? Did you see that? Like, was that a baby? I mean, what was that? It, yeah, I mean, be different, Okay. But as he grew up, he was actually probably a really popular guy. As you see, as you read through his story, what you read is a guy who is, is a life of the party kind of guy, big personality, impulsive, probably fun to be around. He was also, as a manly man, a skillful hunter, and he was really good at it, known for that. If he were alive today, he would have been an athlete, and Isaac would have been at every game, proud of his son. He, wasn't, he would have been not just the best football player on the team, but like in the league, in the state. Be like when my youngest son, Caleb, played junior high football. He played against another middle school that had Jim Jeffcoat's son, and who was a former cowboy, not the son, but the dad. And, and that kid in seventh grade was like six foot two, 200 and something pounds, and he would just run over everybody. My son was a safety, and he, was, and he along with the other ones, were like, yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> you know, it's really not worth it. Just score whatever you need to do. Um, you know, he's smart, my son. <laughs> but, uh, but you could picture Isaac in the stands going, yeah, that's my boy, you know, right? So that's Isaac. I mean, that's Esau, Isaac's favorite. Opposite of that is Jacob. Jacob was the complete opposite of all that. In fact, the little phrase you learn a lot from, it said Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. The Hebrew word translated content also means quiet. He was quietly content. He, he wasn't the loud, boisterous life of the party, testosterone kind of guy. He was quiet. As we'll see, also a thinker, a conniver, a manipulator. His, he was always working in there. His mind, he may have been quiet, but there's a lot going on uh, between his ears. And he loved to stay among the tents, not out in the fields, but among the tents where the women stayed and all that. He loved to cook, as we'll see later. And if you could, he's just very different. So you could picture in that home, if they had TV, you could picture Isaac and Jacob, I mean, excuse me, Isaac and Esau in one room watching ESPN or WrestleMania or, you know, some fight or something like that. And then you could picture Rebecca and Jacob watching Housewives of Orange County in the kitchen or <laughs> HDTV or something, you know, and they're doing their thing. And and so you see these are two different boys, but there was more tension than that. Even more tension than one parent preferring the other and all that, that caused tension. But also tension because Esau had the birthright. He had the baton, the, 
the presumed carrier of the blessing, and Jacob didn't, and he wanted it. And he's gonna find a way to get it. And we see that happen, an opportunity come up in verse 32, or excuse me, verse 29. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, trying out the latest recipe he saw on the Food Network, Esau came in from the open country. He'd been hunting, famished. There's no fast food or anything, you know, so he's just famished, starving. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom, because he wanted to eat them it all up. Uh, <laughs> You guys are so nice. You laugh at anything. I say, I mean, you're so nice. Um, no, Edom means red. Uh, and the stew was red. And so from this story, he got the nickname Red. There's actually a whole nation of people that come from this name. Uh, it's kind of crazy. So you see the setup, okay? Uh, Jacob has something that Esau wants. And Jacob's been waiting for this for a long time. Because Esau has something Jacob wants, right? The birthright. So he proposes a trade. Verse 31, Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. That's the trade. Your birthright for a bowl of stew. Now, I've got a can of Dinty Moore beef stew right here. It even says it's good to the last spoonful. I haven't tried it, but I'm sure they wouldn't lie. And... So I'm sure this is awesome, but think about that trade. A bowl of stew for the birthright, presumed carrier of the blessing of the most significant family on the planet, the most blessed family on the planet. It's not a good trade. And, and if you were watching this movie and you could kind of sniff out what's about to happen, you'd want to be a movie talker and talk to Esau. You know, some of you are movie talkers. Um, I'm not, my wife is, she, uh, especially at home, she's a movie talker, loves to, like when somebody's about to make a mistake, she'll try to keep them from it. You know, like, do you hear that noise in the basement? I'm going to go check it out. You know, she's like, no, don't, you know. And we're like, hon, they're not, they don't hear you. They're not going to, you know, so thanks, lady, you know, or, uh, I, 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 you know, Jason's down there or whatever. And or, uh, or somebody's about to marry somebody, and she knows, you know, in the movie, they're having an affair and already, and she, he's already cheating on whatever. No, don't marry him. He's a lousy, he's a loser. Don't do it, you know? And you're like, hon, I don't think she's going to say, oh, thank you, you know? But in this story, you, you want to do that. You want to be able to speak in and just say, Esau, no, 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 no. This, this is not a good trade. Stu for the blessing. But you can imagine what's going to happen. Verse 32. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. In that moment, he's like, I'm starving. What good is the birthright to me? If I starve to death, it's not going to do me any good anyway. He's, he's like a little dramatic, but he's starving. And Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. All you can say is kind of, wow. For a bowl of stew, he sells away a lot. And you can tell he doesn't really know what he's doing. I mean, he just says he ate and drank and got up and left. No harm, no foul, no big deal, but he had no idea what he had just done. The writer of Genesis, who happens to be Moses, it says, describes it this way, summarizes it this way. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, how did Esau despise his birthright? Was he saying, man, I don't want the baton. I don't want to be first. I'm tired of being first. I don't want to be the big shot. I don't want all that pressure. I don't want to carry the blessing. And all. No, that's not it. As we see in the story, he wanted it as much as Jacob, but he had it. And here's how he despised it, what that means. He devalued it, and he traded it away so cheaply. That's how he despised it. He had it, but he cheapened it because he had no idea what he had, and he trades it away for nothing, trades it away so cheaply. It'd be like my, uh, my father-in-law, Christie's dad, has a 67 Corvette Stingray. That's an awesome car. That's not why I married Christie, but it, it didn't hurt, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and, and she's the oldest, you know, too, so who knows? But... Uh, so let's say he calls us, 
you know, like this week, and says, oh, man, I'm real excited. I traded the vet in for a used smart car. You'd be like, you, you what? You, huh? <laughs> you know, you did. That's not a good trade. You know, or, or be like, just picture this scene, especially art lovers out there. Um, imagine you're at the Louvre in Paris where the Mona Lisa is. The Mona Lisa is painted on wood. And picture a night watchman overnight at the Louvre who gets a little cold, decides to start a fire, and takes the Mona Lisa off the wall and breaks it into pieces for kindling. <laughs> Be like, what? No. That's the kind of thing that we're just seeing in this story. And you look at it, and you're like, Man, what, a, what a bozo. How could he be that much of a doofus? How could he make that big a mistake? How could he make that bad of a trade? But here's where we need to be careful. Because you're right, he was a doofus, he was a bozo, all that. But you and I are too, all the time. We make bad trades. And like him, we don't even realize what we're doing. In our case, what we trade is what God wants for us, his better way, the blessing that we've been created for. And we trade it in, we sell it so cheaply for cheap substitutes. I mean, maybe it's, you know, for, to, get a, to get a sale or to get a promotion or to get a job, we lie and we compromise our integrity, our eventual reputation, what, you know, all this, and we just trade it so cheaply, not really realizing what we're doing. Or maybe it's anger, in a fit of anger. It feels so good to just lash out, physically even, or certainly emotionally or verbally, and we say the thing, and it, we have no idea in that moment what we're giving up, as maybe we crush the heart of a child or our spouse or lose a job over a fit of anger. Or maybe it's substance is that we turn to and I mean, that happens a lot, right, in our culture, and, and we all, you know, we just need an escape. We just need, man, we just, you know, just need a little lift or whatever, and, and we run over there and don't realize what we're giving up in that process, the freedom that God wants for us and the real connection and faith that God wants us to have. Or maybe it's performance for a connection or a career for a connection with the people that we love the most. And and we trade away a lot to get ahead over here. Or maybe relationships, you know, like romantic relationships. You know what God wants and a, a relationship with somebody that is loving and nurturing and where there's dignity and honor and people who are committed to serving each other. And you know that we all crave that. That's what we all want. And yet that can be hard to find. And so you just kind of give up on that and just settle for something far less than that that's not has no, not much dignity or where you feel used or abused or mistreated, and you just keep going to those relationships anyway? Or sex is a great example of that, sex outside of God's design. In fact, that's how the Bible applies what Esau did. And the book of Hebrews talks about what Esau did, and it compares it to sexual immorality. Hebrews 12, 16. See that no one is sexually immoral, or as godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Now, sexual immorality, all that is, is any sexual expression outside of God's design for sex. That's sexual immorality. How is sexual immorality like what Esau did when he sold his birthright for a bowl of stew? Well, because he traded away something so valuable so cheaply. That's what the writer of the Hebrews is saying. The, the idea is this, that what God wants for us in the area of life, our the sexual area of life, is a beautiful and powerful and profound kind of intimacy, realizing that, that sex is designed for this committed relationship called marriage between a man and a woman who learn to serve each other and sacrifice for each other and nurture each other. And in that relationship, sex is designed not just to be a physical act, but to be a powerful soul connection in this intimate relationship called marriage, and it's a beautiful and powerful thing in that, but outside of that, it's actually not just cheaper, it's even destructive. Like with sexual promiscuity, just sleeping around, you know, you think, ah, oh, it's no big deal, I mean, we're consenting adults, and, and it's just a physical act, I mean, that's all it is, just body-to-body -body thing and big deal, but 
God would say, no, it's not the way I designed it. I, it's not just a body-to-body thing. It's a soul-to-soul connection. And every time you experience that, you're just giving away a piece of your soul. And often it's not until much later you realize, oh, man. Same way with affairs, of course, or pornography or anything outside of God's design. We, we trade what God wants for something so much cheaper. And related to that, it, it relates to the hashtag blessed feed on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, when we were designing this series with the design team, that, the creative team that does that, and they you know, just said, hey, let's play around with, let's have fun with hashtag blessed, emoji per hand. Um, I looked at the hashtag blessed feeds and like on Instagram. I did Twitter too, but on Instagram and and it was fine. I mean, it was just all these people didn't do different things. The second time I did, which was on Monday, I looked on Instagram on hashtag blessed, and I was not, I, I just really wasn't prepared for the eyeful of what I got. So be careful doing that, because Instagram tries to keep it clean, but people put stuff on so much, it's hard. And I just caught them in a bad cycle, I guess, because in the hashtag blessed on the Instagram feed, it was maybe one out of 20 were young girls making, who had made naked selfies of themselves and putting them on Instagram. And I was like, I don't get it. I mean, I know I'm kind of out of touch, you know, but I, why? Like, I don't I understand, you know, and so I talked to some people who are, you know, work with youth and everything, just say, hey, help me out, and say, hey, look, this is pervasive, like, everybody, you know, just kind of what you do, and, and boyfriends ask for it, and so whether it's Snapchat it or some other way, then, you know, it just, it just happens all the time. And, and let me just say this, you know, to girls, um, and this is not about shame. I mean, whatever we've done is done, and God's forgiveness is there, and we've all made bad trades. But let me just say, it's, that's a bad trade, trading away your dignity and trading away that part of your life that cheaply. And, uh, and if it's for a guy that asked for it, that's not a good trade either. And if you're that guy, you don't want to be that guy. You're making even a worse trade. Because if you're a guy that asks for that, you're trading the person that not only God wants you to be, but really you want to be. A guy that would treat people, including women, with dignity and respect and value and not be a user. And you don't want to become that guy. That's just a bad trade. If everybody's doing it, that's a, everybody's making a bad trade. But we all make bad trades, especially when we're vulnerable. Most of the time, we're pretty good about making decisions. If we want to follow Jesus especially, we, we avoid bad trades. But there are times we blow it, and usually when we blow it is when we're most vulnerable. And Jacob was looking for an opportunity to find his brother at a vulnerable place where he would make a bad trade. And you and I have an enemy called Satan who is always looking for you and me to be vulnerable so that he can put the wrong thing in front of us and make it look really right and make a bad trade. And so let's look at the story again from that perspective because Esau was vulnerable. He wasn't stupid. He's a smart guy. He wasn't a stupid guy, but he was vulnerable. And he was caught in a vulnerable place and made a really stupid trade, just the way you and I will too. So how can we be vulnerable learning from Esau? Well, one is when we're depleted. Esau was depleted. He was hungry. He was famished. He was starving. And you and I don't make a good, we don't make good decisions when we're hungry. I mean, that's certainly true of food. At least I don't make good decisions when I'm hungry. Um, You ever go to the grocery store, grocery shopping, and you're starving, hungry? It's hard to make good decisions. At least it is for me, especially in my home, because in my home, you know, Christy makes the grocery list, and it's stuff like she eats really healthy. And so it's like kale and spinach and yellow peppers and... You know, this is stuff like that. I'm mean, like, are, are people really supposed to eat that? You know, it's my question. Every time I go, I'm not even sure God wants us. To, I don't think it's going to be in heaven. I mean, all those little things, it's a theological problem for me. So, but I do it. You know, we try to eat that way. But when I'm hungry, none of that looks good, even though I'm starving. You know what looks good? Everything bad looks awesome. And stuff that I normally don't eat because I try to eat healthy too, I'm like, well, I haven't had something like that in a long time. It's a treat. It'll be a treat. You know, every once in a while, you got to give yourself a treat. Boom. 
you know, and then, ooh, there's another treat. You know, ooh, ice cream, that's a treat. Bacon, oh, that's a treat. You know, boom, and you put it in, and all eat, right? Just, and so I, I come back with the weirdest collection of stuff ever, usually with a half-eaten bag of potato chips too, but, you know, you have it all in, and, uh, and Christy's like, um, first of all, what's all this? And secondly, where's the kale and the spinach? <laughs> oh, yeah, they were out of that at all, spoiled, it's a tragedy, it's happens, you know, it's terrible. Oh, man. But, uh, right, so all I'm saying is that when we're depleted, when we're hungry, all the bad stuff looks good. That's not just true of food, though. Emotionally, when we're depleted, everything bad looks good. Spiritually, when we're depleted, everything bad looks good. Physically, when we're depleted, everything bad looks good. It's dangerous when we're depleted because we feel like we're giving ourselves a treat or we're whatever it is and justify just about anything. And that's why we went through simplified and said, man, let's stay replenished, you know, let's, let's not allow ourselves to get depleted. And that's true, but if you're in a depleted state, and I'm sure many people are, just realize you're in a danger zone. And, and you need to not do it by yourself. You need to get replenished, but you also need to talk to somebody. I talk to Bruce, uh, a friend of mine, every Monday morning, we've done it for years, and when I get to a depleted state, uh, I'll say, look, I'm in a depleted state. I need you not just to pray for me, but I need you to text me a lot. I need you to call me. I need you to ask me, are you getting stupid? Because depletion makes me stupid, and, and it's not just me. It's anybody. Depletion is one. Another one is impulsive. We get impulsive. Now, Esau was very impulsive. Jacob was more of a calculated person, and some of you think, yeah, I'm more like Jacob. Some of you, yeah, I'm impulsive. And, but we're all impulsive, Yes, some people are more impulsive than others, but we're all impulsive, which is why stores know that. That's why they put things by the cash register and at the end of the aisles and trying to capture our impulsive dollars. We all make decisions impulsively, not thinking it through the whole way. And so when we are at those moments and we have this impulse, often this bad trade that we're about to make, most often there'll be a little voice in us, maybe it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that'll say, ah, that's not a good idea. We have this twinge of conscience. And impulsively, we can see, ah, it'll be okay. Just like Esau did. Ah, we'll get to that later. Ah, it'll be okay. But I'm going to say, no, stop and listen to that. And, and here's one image that helps me. And that is view your life like a movie, like we talked about earlier. And just real quickly, play that out in your head. If I go ahead and do this, how is this going to play out? If I, you know, maybe... You know, what you're looking at, maybe it's a fit of anger. If I go ahead and just do that, how's that going to play out? If I don't tell the truth here, how's that going to play out eventually? If I go to this porn thing, site, or whatever, how's that going to play out? If I go ahead and sleep with this person, how's that going to play out? Just play out the movie and think, you know, two years from now, three years, am I going to be glad that I did this? Or would I wish I could shout at myself in the movie and say, no, 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 don't. Impulse makes us vulnerable. And then entitlement makes us vulnerable. Being entitled. You know, Esau felt extremely entitled because he had the baton. He was the firstborn, and he was dad's favorite. He was going to give the baton. He had it made. I, don't, I know he didn't realize what would happen because when it does happen, and as we'll see next week, when the blessing is passed to Jacob, he weeps aloud bitterly, it says, Why? Because I don't think he thought the consequence would really happen because I think he felt entitled to the birthright and entitled to the blessing. I don't think he ever thought he could lose it. He never really thought there'd be the consequence. It'd all work out. Christians do it all the time. And the the reason we do it is because if if you become a Christ follower, you realize, well, that happens by grace, by God's work on our behalf, what Jesus did on the cross, that our relationship with God is not based on our performance, but his performance for us, which is awesome. And that means that we're forgiven. And so a lot of times what Christians will say is, well, yeah, I know it's not the best thing and I shouldn't, but you know what? God will forgive me. God will forgive me. And you know what? You're right. If you have a relationship with Jesus, then God will forgive you. He already has. But here's where that logic really breaks down. That is that God's forgiveness is not the same thing as consequence removal. And God won't remove our consequences. In fact, he tells us the opposite. He warns us. He says, if you plant bad seed, you will harvest bad fruit. 
Every time. The problem is there's a gap between when you plant the seed, make the decision, make the bad trade, and when the fruit comes up eventually. And in that thing, we figure, oh, it'll be okay, and then boom, the consequence. And there's always consequences to bad trades. Sin comes with death and destruction of the blessing 100% of the time. Now, that doesn't mean life is over when you find yourself in consequences. God's grace is there, too, to help us through the consequences, even redeem the consequences, but God lets us go through the consequences. And some of you are in consequence mode right now, and you need to cling to God, not run from Him, but realize, I mean, I know you realize, man, I wish I would have made a different trade. So here's what I want us to do. In a little bit, we're going to talk to God. We're going to pray, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk to God And one question I want us to go to with God is, okay, God, what bad trade am I making right now? Or am I I, I considering? Am I prone to make? Or I'm right in the middle of making it right now? What bad trade? We've used a lot of illustrations. There's a lot more we could do. But God, just what bad trade am I in danger of making or in the middle of making? And And help me reverse course. And then... Another great question to say, or another thing to ask God about is, God, am I willing, and maybe just say, I am willing to make a good trade. And what's the good trade? The good trade is, our, is God's better way versus our way. That's what Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. It's available to everybody. I came to bring it to live this whole new life, life in my blessing. It's not just those who say yes to the invitation. There's another decision to be made, and he talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 24. Here it is. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. It's not just saying yes to Jesus. It's not just believing in him. It's also the idea of repent is what the Bible says, but I turn from my way to God's better way, and I say I'm not only going to hear Jesus' words, I'm going to put them into practice. And when we have the discipline of submitting to his better way and putting his truth into practice, even if I don't like it, even if I don't understand it, even if I don't think it should be that way, I say, you know what? Compared to God, I don't know a lot. He knows a lot more. He's a lot better than I am. He's the one that created everything. I'm going to bend to his better way. Even if this trade looks pretty good, I'm going to say, you know, I don't think so. I'm going to bend to God's better way. Let's go to God together in prayer. Praying is just talking to God in your own words. There's no special language you got to use or buzzwords or he's just your father who loves you, wants to talk to you. And right now, just in your heart, just say, God, um, what bad trade am I in danger of making or justifying or maybe making? And just say, God, please don't let me be stupid. Please help me move from that to your better way. And he will. And if some of you feel shame right now because of some bad trade and you feel so exposed and like, oh man, I'm just the biggest goober ever, join the club. Every one of us in here feels that way. And God knows that. And then... God, just say, God, I, I, if you're up for it, I, I want to make the good trade. Help me to choose your better way. For some, that may mean beginning to, choosing to be a Jesus follower for the first time and saying, God, I just want to follow you. I want to not only earn, you know, get to go to heaven when I die, I want to know your blessing now. And, and you make relationship possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. And I say yes and ask him to come into my life and help me live this new way. And, And for those who've done that, an opportunity just to recommit to God's better way. Father, we thank you for your grace that's always there. That's always pulling us towards your better way. Your patience with us, just like you were with Jacob, just like you were in those, all those guys in the past, same way with us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.